that is your prayer along with the We've got it turned up all the way on high. That's where it is. I thought I was having a hot flash, and I really thought I was going to be on that. So I was like, I'm thinking it was good news to hear that it was a problem with the heating system. Sasha, you're not screaming that hard, are you? No. Well, thank you, and we can begin at any point now. Um, I really do want to say, first of all, a big welcome to all of you, and especially those of you who had uh, traveled in the storm. I got a St. Louis, Missouri, welcome. <laughs> I, I'm reading a book right now by uh, Bishop Remy Saru, the youngest bishop at Vatican II. Some of you I know have read that. And uh, something that he said really struck me about this weekend. He said that when the bishops gathered every day to pray at the beginning of each uh, council session. They began by saying, here we are, Lord. Here we are. Here we are, Holy Spirit. Here we are. So I'd like us to begin that same way. Here we are, Holy Spirit. Here we are. I also want to begin this day with gratitude, and I'm not going to, and I cannot thank everyone who made it possible, but I really do want to thank all of those who did work to make it possible, and, and just give a special mention to Sister Helen Oates of Stone Otis, she also says. Uh, she has done so much of the preparation in the absence of Sister Kay Naughton, and Kay is doing um, better, certainly improving, but still in need of our prayer. And I'm thankful, of course, for all of those um, from the left. Mother Helps, who make this such a nice event for all of us. Um, also want to thank our associate advisory board and all of those who serve on all of our committees. And um, you know that Sister Pat Gilchin is with us every year as our province liaison and such a tremendous support for our association. So we're welcome to Sister Pat. Sister Catherine McNamee is our congregational um, leadership liaison, and Catherine is also with us today, so thank you for that coming. <laughs> and then, in addition to Catherine, we have another member, so we have 50% of the congregational leadership <laughs> with us, because Sister Susan Haynes is also with us. So welcome. I know that at the beginning and at the end of these days, I'm sure at the end of these days, we will be thanking especially Mr. Sean Madigan and Associate Michelle Brani. They've really been preparing for this for many, many months now, and, um, and will be leading us through this whole process. And then, of course, thanks to all of you for being here and for continuing to respond to God's call to us as Associate <coughs> Now, I just want to leave us with a couple of things to lead us into this day. Um, I, I'm sure that all of you have been praying for this day, as I have. And as I pray, there are two images that have come to me out of that prayer and reflection. One is from Scripture. The other is from a four-year-old. <laughs> the Scripture is a favorite of mine. It's that wonderful story of Mary and Martha. And you know that great line of Jesus that he speaks to Martha, Oh, Martha, Martha, Mary has chosen the better part. Now, I don't know about the other women in this room, but I know that for many years, that kind of irritated me <laughs> that you would say such a thing, because what I would think to myself is, yeah, she might have chosen the better part, she ch certainly chose the easier part. <laughs> because Martha's out there doing all the work, right? But you know, as I've gotten older and I'm a little bit wiser, I think I realize the courage that it took for Mary and for us to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen. Listen to Jesus, listen to the Holy Spirit, because we never know what we're going to do and what might call and challenge us. So Mary, I think, is a real risk taker. That's my scripture image, the four-year-old image. 
Um, I worked at a parish here where we had a tradition on All Saints Day. Um, Andra and Rick, you might remember this, they're from that parish. Um, that we had a tradition on All Saints Day of inviting children to wear the Halloween costumes again that morning for Mass and to bring with them some something from the treats that they had collected, Christmas treating the night before, to share with children who had none. So at the presentation of the gifts, they would go forth with their little bag of treats, and we had a big basket in front of the altar, and they would, as children do, make a long straight line procession of aha. How the students flying up to the steps to the basket in front of the altar and dropping into it the treats that they were going to share with others. Well, one year happens, children all get up there, they're dropping in their, their bags full of treats, turning around, coming back to their pews, and when all of them are back, we look up, and there's one little girl still standing up there, looks to be about four years old, standing at the side of the basket, holding that bag of treats over the basket, struggling, but she can't quite let go. <laughs> Every eye in the church is on this child. There, if there's dead silence, everybody's watching, watching. And you can see her almost being able to do it, but not quite. Until finally, finally, she let go of that bag full of her Halloween treats. And when she did so, the entire church burst into a wall. <laughs> and she turned around and literally kind of just skipped back. <laughs> So this weekend, I pray that we may have the courage, like Mary, and later Martha, I believe, to really listen to the Spirit of God uh, and to one another, and then with our little four-year-old friend, to be able to really let go of anything that would hold us back from responding to the mission of Jesus. So let our prayer this weekend be, we are here, Holy Spirit. We are here. And I'd like to call forth those who are going to be leading us in our opening prayer, sharing of the heart this morning. Great volunteers are going to lead uh, an invocation of prayer, and then we all have a response, and we'll see it on the screen. Um, and I'm going to put you to work. Um, each one is a, a different word, but we're going to have the same melody that we're going to sing. I'll sing it first, and then you repeat it. So um, let's practice. First, uh, the first invocation is going to be. Yeah. 
fun, groaning of a disconnected world. Yeah.
We're excited to be here. And, you know, I was thinking last night that John the 23rd opened up Vatican II with open the windows and let a fresh air blow through. Well, we certainly started with tornadoes, so we've got that. <laughs> you, wonder, you wonder what what's in store for us this weekend with, with that kind of a start. And, you know, the question probably is, what are, what are we really about this weekend? And very simply, we're here to craft our shared vision of what's emerging among us for CSJ Association. Um, that, that really, this weekend is really about all of you sharing with one another, talking, listening, and seeing what emerges. When we were looking at uh, what may be emerging, putting it in a larger context of history, you could be looked at as a late holiness movement. We've had those throughout the history of the church. Um, a lot of ink has been spilled on the 13th century versions, the deans, the guards. Late holiness movements, they were not initiated by any outside force. They were initiated from within. And that's um, how we are looking at association. It's a lay holiness movement at this point in time. When those lay holiness movements emerged in Roman Catholic Church history, there were always two conditions that were there with the emergence. One condition is that people became conscious of the within. They became conscious of a call to conversion of heart. But most of them came to the consciousness somewhat simultaneously. A second condition is that those who represented official church structures were generally perceived to be at a distance from the holiness of the people. So those uh, two conditions put us somewhat in touch with the past, but it is interesting to look at your holiness movement that we name association. And we're at a very important time where we're exploring together the consciousness that's among us and how to respond to the inner call that we're all feeling. I, I don't, I've never talked to a CSJ associate that, that doesn't, there's an inner call that we are all feeling. And there's a, there's an urgency to want to bring that to the world. And so this weekend is to engage in two days of what we are very familiar with, sharing of the heart in the state of our house, because we will have times when we say, what is emerging among us and trying to pull that together and summarize it. Awareness of the divine presence is more important than anything that Sean and I are going to stand up here and say. Well, it's uh, one thing to talk about vision, constructing dreams, sharing hopes, etc. Eventually, visions need to be put into structures that will guide, give life to, and serve as uh, permeable boundaries. In other words, a life holiness movement in time does construct for that time what might be called a rule of life, a way of life, sisters name that constitution. But there does come a time when a group identifies its mode of holiness, is able to name it, and to quote Habakkuk the prophet, writes the vision clearly for this point in time. So that's a piece of hope for this weekend. And we're going to begin um, the weekend by touching in on our, our charism of unifying love, and, and that it's alive and well in our world today. Um, how much Living from this vantage point is needed for the challenges that we face as a global community. How much it, it, understanding our interconnectedness and unifying love is very important. And the four communions in living sacred mystery 
calls us to living from the deep belief that we are all connected. <clears throat> Jesus' message was very simple. Love one another. And it's in caring for one another that the kingdom of God is present. We bring that to the world. And this is the love that unifies. So our time will be the kind of grounding from which the vision that Sean was uh, talking about will emerge. And it will provide the direction for realizing what it is we feel called to as a community. And we won't be finished in these two days, but we do hope to have a direction that moves us forward in hope that the Spirit holds out to us. Because we are, as Sean referred, a lay holiness movement for this time, with the maturing spirituality that was also born of Vatican II, and it's the kind of spirituality the world needs to address the issues that we face. And there are not many, not everybody could be with us this weekend, so we want to take this deep conversation and explore it uh, further in our small communities. So we will follow this weekend um, with continued conversation. Well, where is that? Oh. We will be following this weekend with continued conversation in our small associate sister communities. Um, and the conversation will be designed to deepen our understanding of what's emerging from this body and what we are willing to commit to. And so this time next year, our hope is really that we will take the work back to this body to bless it and from there be able to move forward in conversations with the sisters about our partnership going forward because we will have clarified what we really are about, what we're willing to commit to, and how we would like to move forward with them in that. So those are the next steps of, of this work. So this body is really setting the direction and the tone for all of that. Okay, and the further uh, context for looking at what we're doing together are a couple of points. The maxims, so-called maxims of perfection from Jean Pierre could be looked at at that point in time as a way of focusing meaning of the gospel. Part of uh, his hope is that, quote, I hope that this way of life fills you with Christ Jesus, flows you with himself, in the fullness of the Spirit, that you may be rooted in perfect peace, and so be guided into hope and possession of eternity. Now, uh, this is just a little trivia, but after the Council of Trent, which is 1600s, 1650s, um, the church dropped out Holy Spirit from many of its official prayers. As well as Pius V, not mention of spirit. However, Sean Herman I said every day, I wish you to invoke the Holy Spirit and say very frequently, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful. So a few hundred years later, uh, we look upon yourselves as an answer to that prayer. Fill the hearts of your faithful. It's another holiness movement, an interesting trivia pursuit. <laughs> well, this sacred mystery, and everyone has this in your folder, <clears throat> this is the essence of our CSJ spirituality, and it's the thread that reaches back to the 17th century. <laughs> And being immersed in sacred mystery <coughs> means saying yes to the mystery of transformation. So, so know, this is our creed. creed. We kind of lost the script here, but oh, creed. <laughs> well, this is another trivia, too. Uh, that word creed that we use rather loosely today, I believe, that's a mistranslation of the earliest mode of Christian belief which was two words in the Latin translation, 
core and do, core, heart, do for definition of verb. I give where I place. I place my heart for do. I give myself to this. When congregational chapters meet, statements like this statement on sacred history can be looked upon as a creed. This is the spirituality to which I give my heart at this point in time. Your commitment statements are for Joe. This is where I put my heart. This is what I'm giving my life to. So at any point in time, when a congregational chapter meets, if they are doing more than the routine business, they are stating what we believe, the best we can describe it, at this point in time. So that spirituality of communion that uh, you've seen often isn't really the way we describe for ourselves sacred mystery. It's actually a way of describing what has already taken possession of us. So it's not a within. It is a without that our within becomes conscious of. So, sacred mystery, this will be the basis of our exploration this weekend. Um, two areas important to associates that keep coming up over and over in different surveys and gatherings that we've been at are relationship and mission. These are primary. So our focus this morning will be exploring the communion of relationships and responding to the groaning of the disconnected world. And we're going to look at how is the Spirit working and to what newness are we being called around these two primary pieces of what we say we're about. So, in a way, uh, on the one hand, we all uniquely are possessed by and possess sacred mystery. We're all original sinners. We're also all original saints. So there is a unique way of grasping being grasped. At the same time, there is a, a sameness, a spirituality, that we are living in common, or we wouldn't all be here today. So it's the corporate that we will attempt to name uh, throughout the weekend. And our process is really going to be through table sharing and then sharing in the, in the larger group. We'll explore our individual and community experience in, in the two areas, in these two areas, relationship and mission. And listen to what is, is coming. What's the common threads that are coming up among us? What are some other viewpoints that we need to pay attention to? Um, and we're not going to have complete answers at the end of the two days, but we, we will, I really believe we will have a direction, and we will we'll just really understand more about what we're about and what we feel called to. And I think it's very important. Um, it, it's a point in time where the challenge, in, the challenge for the whole world essentially is to Stop being stuck in how things currently are and try to imagine how can they be and what do we want to commit ourselves to getting there because there are lots of issues in our world and we could spend whole two days talking about what those are that really uh, you wonder where we're going and why we can't make the changes we need to as, as people. Um, so that's what this weekend is about through our table sharing. And we want to invite, to begin, we really want to invite all of us to read this out loud together. And after reading this out loud, we'll have a few minutes of quiet. And I will ring the bell when the quiet time is over. And then invite everyone at that point to say a word of praise 
from this that resonates with them at this time. I think that's a real, really, I think getting into the silence, I mean, we're inviting you to get into that sacred space within where, where you can hear God's voice. So let us read this together. Sacred mystery, you grace us in unifying love, and we know communion. The heart of God, the trinity of relationships, holds together all that exists in the communion of relationships that constitutes the web of life. We breathe in that communion, and with it the hopes, yearnings, pains, and sorrows. Invite anyone to share a word of praise. <laughs> Michelle, Michelle, I don't think everybody can hear. His phrase is urgency to respond to the groaning of a disconnected world.
together and said, embrace the urgency. So we need to really look, I mean, we've been talking and talking, but we need to now embrace it and look at this being something we really need to work on. Embrace the urgency, something we really need to look at. Trinity of relationships. God's unifying love. I'm thinking all of this is really just cooperating in, with God. Gosh, if we could ever get there. <laughs> <laughs> cooperating with God, God's unifying love. Mystery of transformation. And it seems what a person needs to notice. Mystery of transformation and noticing that the transformation is happening. Uh, I too was struck by that mystery of transformation, which of course is the goal. Um, but we need to, it seems to me that I need to look beyond what, what I work with now so that, that my goal is clear and I can perceive when something is taking what always pops in my mind recently is that all may be one that, that was in the scripture and that was pounding on our door about the time that the Egyptian mess was going on and how they came together and messed it up. They came together and there was not a violent thing and all I can think of here is this mystery, one tiny bit of it, this mystery of transformation for the whole nation and the things that they used to do it. So we see that all the little things that are around us and all the ways that big things that we might not see or might not realize can happen. And that's a part of our role, the mystery of transformation. We want to transform the whole bit into God's vision that all may be one. The mystery of transformation. Focusing on what unites and ignore all else. Focusing on what unites and ignore all else. Carol? Our hopes, yearnings, pains, and struggles of each other, I think, between the associates, which would get to that point where we again become one. The hopes and yearnings and struggles with each other, that we can get to the point of being one, particularly with the sisters and associates. Embrace in the heart of God, because it just seems that the whole sacred mystery is all about loving, being loved and loving. Embrace in the heart of God and the sacred mystery is about loving and, and being loved.
what does the groaning imply? We participate. It's an action. Communion of relationships. Together, we are so much stronger. We feed off each other. I know how much being an associate, just being with the sisters, is a part of growing in my spirituality and other things. So together, we are stronger. But the communion of relationships what it means to each of our lives and then to the world. Communion of relationship. I would like to respond to what you said, the implication of groaning. To me, groaning is the world that we live in. You know, the, the strife, all the stuff that's going on. To me, that's what the uh, groaning would imply to me. Groaning to me is in getting for a Giving birth is also growing and it brings new life and, and it's not easy and to really choose life isn't easy, is it? it? I think we're all old enough in this room to realize that, that you're never going to reach a point where, well, we made all the right choices and now we can just sit back and enjoy it and nothing else happens. It just it doesn't work that way. Um, our, next, our next part it is we're gonna we'd like you to watch a video because central to our CSJ spirituality is the belief that we're all one and all of you were sharing that. And at this point in our human history, science is demonstrating just how interconnected we are. Not only with each other, but with all of creation. And our sacred mystery creed says, the heart of God, a trinity of relationship, holds together all that exists in a communion of relationships that constitutes the web of life. I think I didn't put that up here. Look at that. And for centuries we have professed this through our faith, and now science is demonstrating this belief and finding ways to prove it is not just our faith, but it is our reality. So you know, today, fortunately this weekend, we have the celebration of Body of Christ. Today when we look at communion of relationships, uh, that Body of Christ, I realize our human arrogance makes us think that's only ourselves. But the Body of Christ and the mystery of incarnation is the whole world. So when we look at relationships, the mystical body worthy of resurrection is all that is. Because we too are microcosms of the universe. That right? makes us a stardust, but we're a community of relationships. We got little microbes in us, right? The digestive system. I mean, we have a lot of things that make us a community. So the heart of God, Trinity of Relationships, this video doesn't address directly, but it will address how broad the community of relationships is and the new consciousness required to perceive and move into it. After the video, uh, we'll have three questions or reflections um, that you can leave as a table if you're so close to the air conditioner you can't hear each other. But there will be three questions we'll ask you to consider as a table. And there they are. And we will put these back up here after the video. And at, at your table, you're sh you'll share around, especially the first two, and then what we want you to bring back so that we can share it with the larger group. Each table will share. As you listen to each other, is there a larger vision emerging around our understanding of the communion of relationships. And you can move throughout the room, and if you can't see that screen so well, 
as the video starts, feel free to stand up, walk, and what your adults do what you need to do. And, when, and also when it's time to share, if your table is, if you're in a place it's hard to hear, like am I back here where this air conditioning is running, feel free to go to another room here at Garanda Lab and, and share because we'll tell you what time to come back. So whatever you need to do to hear each other, that's fine too. Now we'll just see if we can get the video up. Says that 
the earth, the being of the earth is like honey, and all of our beings are like honey. And the being of the earth absorbs <coughs> into itself, and we absorb the being of the earth and the universe into us. It's the essence, the milk of existence. And because of this sort of sticky <coughs> interconnection, I know one thing, I know everything. When I speak to one person, I speak to everyone. When I touch this table, I'm also touching the sun. And it's not only that there's an interconnection, it's also that there's a luminosity that animates every single one of us, all beings on the planet, just like sunshine shining through honey. This is called purusha in this tradition, the animating light force that connects us all. So between this sticky substance that keeps us all together and the luminosity that connects the individual to the cosmic, there is a way that one cannot be without the other, and when one thing happens to one aspect of the system, it also happens to the other. It's a very sweet metaphor. <laughs> so this isn't only in Eastern traditions that we find this, it's also in Christianity. Christ in the Bible says, my father is in me and I am in him and I am in you and you are in me and salvation has to do with understanding that God's kingdom is in all of us and that Christ's body we are each a part of. It appears in Judaism, in Islam, and in the world's indigenous traditions, which actually don't make a very big deal out of it because they believe it's absolutely common sense that we're all interconnected. So not only have these kinds of subjective experiences of oneness and interconnection, this realization about the nature of reality being completely interconnected started religions, they also underlie entire movements. Uh, Martin Luther King says, in a real sense, all life is interrelated. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We're tied into a network of mutuality, a single garment of destiny. And so that when injustice is done to one, it's done to everyone. This kind of realization has also been something that underlie civil rights movements, but also human rights movements. And so this is a Nobel Peace Prize winner, Alvaro Schweitzer, who was one of the first anti-war, anti-nuclear activists and was a, someone who built hospitals and worked in Africa and made his life about altruism. And his work came out of this idea that we are united with all of life and that we cannot any longer live for ourselves alone. John Muir, so this is another way that these experiences of interconnectedness have impacted our society is by pushing people toward conservation movements because when we find that we are interconnected with this whole system of being and stand in awe and wonder of that realization, we can't do anything else but begin to conserve that precious blue jewel that Edward Mitchell and other astronauts saw from space. John Muir puts it in a very nifty way. When we try to take out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. And so also science. This realization has inspired scientists to look further, to look deeper into the nature of reality. And Albert Einstein went all the way to say that our sense of ourselves as individuals who are separated from the rest is an optical of our consciousness, and that our work in this lifetime is to break free from that prison, that delusion. Another wonderful philosopher, Alan Watts, said, not only is it a delusion, it's a dangerous delusion, because when I feel like I'm separate from you, when I can keep myself separate from it, from the planet, from things that I think are other, I can engage in actions that benefit me, but harm others. When I break free of that delusion. I can't no longer do that. And so science now is a way that we are increasingly relying on more and more instead of religion, or in addition to religion, to understanding the nature of reality and what things are really like and what our potential is. And so I'm engaged in a scientific effort to look into this phenomenon of interconnectedness. Is it true? that we are, in fact, interconnected, not only at a subjective level, but maybe at an objective or a physical level. Are we more I, or are we more we, or 
Where are we both? Is there any way to investigate this paradox that makes sense in the natural world? And so first I'll start with telling you a little bit about what science is telling us about just the interconnection in our own bodies. For a long time, there was an emphasis on little individual parts of our body that were responsible for certain things. So if I was thirsty, it was a small part of my brain that was thirstier. If I see a snake in my pathway, it's in the snake section of my brain. It turns out that our brains and our bodies are these distributed networks of holistic responses to the world around us. And no one part functions much without the other part. There's a diversity in our cells, for example, skin cells, gut cells, lung cells, brain cells, that can't really work without one another. It's like a symphony of life. And this is how we are now starting to look at the body and the brain and the whole system that must be addressed together. Now, another interesting thing is we're realizing now that we have thousands of other creatures that actually live in on us, microbes, fungi, all these little guys. So when we say we are a we, it's not just the royal we anymore. It's quite literal. <laughs> also, our DNA we're finding now doesn't actually, it, it's not a blueprint for who we become. It's not a destiny or a determined way that will emerge. What we're finding now is that for the most part, genes are expressed in an experience-dependent fashion. They are expressed in response to how we interact with the world around us. And in particular, many of our psychological traits and our personality traits are developed as an interaction between our genes and thousands of micro-interactions have with our caregivers as we're growing from being infants to children, but also in our adult lives. So who we are is absolutely determined by not just our genetic code, but every single person and situation that we interact with throughout our lives, particularly when those are repeated. Social psychology is finding that we are more socially mediated than we ever knew we were. There's contagious a contagiousness of happiness. There's contagion of obesity. As Malcolm Gladwell said, there are contagions of ideas, epidemics of ideas. And the new social science is starting to show us that when we're in a room with other people, so much of what's happening in our bodies, in our brains, in our thoughts, in our beliefs, and what we have perceived to be our free will is actually this complex mediational process that we're in with other people in the room. There's also some very interesting research happening now in social media where you can actually track the way that ideas make their way out into uh, the world, kind of like watching migrational patterns. And so all of that is maybe what you could call traditional science. It's, it's looking into more and more the ways that we are socially interconnected. What we're engaged in at the Institute of Noetic Sciences takes it one step further where we're not only looking at how people are connected through traditional ways of knowing through the five senses, but also beyond that. Is there a way that we're interconnected that isn't through traditional connection? And so what we do in one of the set of experiments, for example, is we get a pair of people and we separate them. We take one person to a sender's chamber where they sit in front of a closed circuit television or down an internet live stream and they're shown their partner on the screen, off and on. Now the sender might be hooked up to autonomic measures or brain wave measures as well. But then we escort the receiver to a 2,000 pound electromagnetically shielded steel box. So they are sitting there protected from any influence, including that that any of their partner might send on a traditional level. And so here we are having the sender shown the image of the person, and when they're shown the image of the person who's the receiver, they're asked to direct all their attention and intention toward that person. When the person goes off the screen, they're asked to remove their intention and attention from that person. And what's fascinating is that what we're finding 
is when the sender should sends that attention intention <coughs> toward the person in the receiving chamber, the physiology of the person in the receiving chamber actually changes. And so we don't really have an explanation for this yet, but we do have now dozens of studies showing evidence for this connection. This is a slide from a different laboratory looking at how the brain reacts to a light flash. And what you see across the top is right in the middle, the sender has a light flash and their brain has a major reaction to that light flash. But you'll also see that their partner below has a little echo of that light flash. And so we haven't explained this yet, but it is very enticing information about how we might be interconnected. These experiments were pioneered by Marilyn Schlitz and others at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. We did an experiment where we brought in cancer patients and their partners and asked their partners to learn a compassionate intention intervention that was based on Tibetan practices. And after the training, what we found is that their connection at a distance, again, was increased. And so another way we're looking at interconnection is not just between people, it's between people's minds and the physical world. So this is an ingenious experiment that was developed by my colleague Dean Raby. And so what we know in quantum physics is that when we have a stream of light, a stream of photons that's being shot down a tunnel through two little slits, this is called the double slit experiment, um, when someone knows which slit the photons go through, when someone observes it or a machine observe it, observes it, the photons act like particles. When nothing is observing it, they act like waves. And you know that because you can see the pattern on the back wall. There's either two slits or there's a wave refraction pattern. So this is called the quantum measurement problem. We don't know why measurement or observation changes this. What we do in our laboratory is we have people look at the system only using their minds. So they're not using their eyes, they're not using a camera, they're not using any kind of the traditional measurement equipment. They're just observing the system, you could say, psychically or clairvoyantly. They're projecting their minds into the system. And what we find is that when they're doing that, it collapses the wave function. In other words, the particles, the, the light stream, the photons, act more like particles than they do like waves, as though they were being observed in person. So again, both of these experiments, we don't know exactly what to make of the results, but we do know that, number one, the, the effect seems to be instantaneous. It happens at exactly the same time. So it doesn't seem to be sort of like sending an email or sending a letter. We also know that it appears to be non-local, so it doesn't matter that much if the person is 40 feet away or 400 or 4,000 or 400 miles away from either the receiver, who's a human, or from the double slit experiment. The final way I'll share with you, and there are other ways that we are looking at this phenomenon, is a set of colleagues and us are looking at whether collective upheavals in consciousness affect systems that are physical. If we use a random number generator, which is a little machine that spits out a series of zeros and ones at the rate of about 800 bits per second. And the idea is that if there is greater coherence in a collective group of people, you could say like a baseball game, um, we looked at things like 9-11, we've looked at the opening ceremonies at the Olympics, when lots and lots and lots of people's attention are focused on one thing, is there a little departure from randomness in this stream of random numbers? And what we find is, in fact, there is a tiny departure from randomness that seems to correlate with exactly the same time that there are these huge upheavals in consciousness. So while tiny, the change is highly statistically improbable. So this is the kind of thing we're investigating using the tools of science to look into connection and interconnection both in person with each other and from a distance. And you might ask yourself, well, this is all fascinating, but why? What, why does this matter? I mean, other than the fact that maybe it's, you know, questioning the <coughs> fundamental basis of the nature of reality, why do we care? Well, <laughs> what brings me to do this work is that when we look at this interconnection, when we study the interconnection among people, if it is, in fact, the case that our minds 
influence our bodies, which we now know to be true, if it's the case that we influence each other much more than we ever thought was possible when we're in rooms with each other, when we watch each other on the TV, if it's even possible that we're connected at a distance, or maybe that we collectively are somehow connected to the way the physical world functions, then one of the things we can do is shift the way we are thinking. We can use <coughs> our consciousness in ways that are constructive, innovative, reverent. We can bring positive influence into our world. And it's not enough to just think positively, but I do believe that that kind of using our consciousness, recognizing that our consciousness matters, uh, is a precursor to the kind of action we all need to take to help our world thrive, to help humanity reach its full potential. And this is a quote from the Institute of Noetic Sciences first president, because of the interconnectedness of all minds, affirming a positive vision might be the most sophisticated vision that any one of us can take. Thank you.